Welcome to Cloud Native Database Development, an on-demand session of Oracle Database World. I'm Brian Spendolini, a product manager in the Oracle Database Development Tools organization. So what is Cloud Native? The Cloud Native Computing Foundation describes or defines Cloud Native as Cloud Native technologies and power organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments, such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. So that's great, but what does it actually mean for database development? What is Cloud Native? So Cloud Native is all about speed and agility, the ability to develop and deliver products faster than we have before because there's much more resources and infrastructure for us to create because most of it is all software now. And we also have the ability to take full advantage of these cloud environments or these cloud services that we're in. So being able to create infrastructure, networking, compute instances, databases very quickly and with deployment models that embrace automation uh, such as Terraform or Ansible, as well as the native APIs that are built into every cloud vendor or every cloud service that are out there. We also embrace the ability to have these environments scale, make them resilient as well as flexible. Flexible not only in how they perform, but flexible in payment as well, because cost savings is part of this. So having a compute instance that knows that it's running out of resources and is able to create more or add more memory or add more storage, or a database that can do something very similar or even a database that knows that it needs to have a copy of itself in another region across the world or across the country, so that if there was an outage, it can seamlessly switch over to that other environment. And lastly, as I touched on flexibility before, but flexibility not only in all these items that I just talked about, scale, elasticity, and resiliency, but flexibility in pricing being able to, to pay for the resources and only the resources that you're using at any one time. If these environments scale, go up and down, then only allow me to pay for those resources that are being used. So maybe this database has a maximum amount of 50 CPUs that it's able to use and 100 gigabytes of memory. Well, if most of the time it's only sitting at one CPU and say 10 gigabytes of memory, let me only pay for that. And then when it does need that extra resources, I'll pay for those when those are being used. Another point of these cloud native or environments, part of this development is observability. Being able to know what's going on at any point in time, having log files and metrics, all these things flow into a single place. So if something is going wrong, a spike, an attack, or an outage, I could see which environments are affected and then be able to act upon or set triggers on those issues so that something can automatically be restarted, the right people can be alerted, and I can fix it immediately instead of having long outages. And then lastly, using these easy to deploy to uh, infrastructure such as Kubernetes or Dockers or an environment that is stateless to deploy these uh, compute uh, to deploy these applications to that I can switch over maybe in a blue green uh, deployment model. So this brings us to the 12 factor app methodology. This is a methodology that was coined around 2011 by Adam Wiggins. Now, these are in essence a best practices guide for deploying applications to the cloud. Now, we do see 12 of them here, and if you want more information on any one of these, you can go to 12factor.net. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a few of these and see how they apply to database development in cloud native environments. Before we go over some of these steps in detail, Let's quickly cover why database development or cloud native database development is so difficult in the environments that some of you work in today. One of the biggest issues we see is between stateful and statelessness. So a lot of times our application developer friends, counterparts, coworkers that we have within our organizations, they're very used to these stateful stateless environments. They can deploy their applications and as we quickly said before, a blue-green deployment where I can switch between container A and container B with container B having the new deployment and container A having the old one and we can 
change something in our load balancer, say switch over to that new environment and now our application has its new changes within it. We can't do this with database development because that database is always accepting transactions, taking in changes, uh, serving data out. So we can't just kind of go do this methodology with that database because it is a stateful environment. We also see traditionally there's a lack of versioning with our database objects. How do we version our database objects? How do we version our databases in these stateful environments? How do we, are we able to switch between the two or to be able to deploy to these environments while tracking these changes? And when we apply these changes, a lot of times we're forced, if there is an issue in production, do we roll back or do we roll forward? Uh, we see a lot of people now looking at rolling forward in, when there is an issue in production, then you take that change and backport it to all the environments. But we need these options to be able to do either or. When our database developers are working on a task or they're working on their tickets and they're required to check in their code, a lot of times they get distracted, they have to go walk the dog, they, it's dinner time, they're working at home, what have you, they have to go pick up the kid. They're, they go and they have these changes in the database and they may be doing manually scripting these individual changes, these individual objects. And there may come a time where they forget a table change or they forget to pull that procedure they changed. They check in that code and as that code goes through the, the pipeline from you know, UAT or development to UAT to production, it's going to hit errors and it's not going to compile because they forgot or missed that change that they have. So we need a way to, to get all those changes without having to do it manually as well as giving these database developers environments they can work in to make sure they aren't working in isolation, but they're working within the code line they're supposed to be working in, as well as working in their own environment. Because we don't want them to be sharing database systems and accidentally compile a procedure they're working on where another developer is working on the very same procedure and overwrite someone's code. So not only can they not work in isolation and not know what's going on with other people's codes, they also need to be working in an individual environment so they're not stepping on each other. So how do we do this work with this duality of isolation but individual environment? The first item we're going to talk about is code base. And this in essence says being able to give your database developers the ability to have database change tracking and change management across environments, as well as utilize code repositories. And we can do this with SQL CL and Liquibase. SQL CL, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is our next generation command line interface for working with the Oracle database. And within SQL CL, we have put Liquibase. Now, Liquibase is going to give you the ability to do this change management and change tracking very easily. The first thing we can do is we can generate the code for individual objects. So you can see here with LB gen object, we can generate the code for individual objects such as tables, procedures, triggers, indexes, or we can generate uh, rest Oracle REST data service modules, REST modules that you create, or we can tip pull out application express applications with this process. Now, previous to this, we did talk about, first we can see LB gen object, and this is going to give you the ability to pull the changes for individual objects, such as database objects as tables, functions, triggers, indexes, or Oracle REST data services modules, or even application express apps. We can also pull out the entire schema that developer is working on. As we talked about previously, sometimes the developer might be distracted and may forget to pull all the changes they did in that database environment they're working in. Well, we can use Liquibase Gen Schema to capture all those objects that the developer is working on. We can see those changes. And then when you commit that code to your code repository, only those changes will be reflected, which makes very easy code reviews 
and branch merges because we know exactly what is changes, what is changed. And we also are capturing them all. We're not forgetting to grab a function or a table change that that developer forgot to grab. We talked about also the ability to roll back or roll forward, where Liquibase does give you the ability to automatically roll back those changes in a particular environment. And we can also use the Liquibase diff command to look at the differences between two connected schemas. So if we wanted to compare the differences or the object differences between two schemas in two different databases, we are able to do it via this Liquibase command. So this is going to give you the ability to do this change management and change tracking, which is part of that cloud native database development. The next item I'm going to look at is config. And this says that we need to have reusable, configurable templates for creating infrastructure pieces, whether that's networking, compute instances, databases, security policies, whatever it may be, we need to be able to do this quickly and have it done in essence as infrastructure as code. So we can do this in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure in multiple ways. And one of the ways we can do this is with Terraform. So in OCI, we have the ability to use what we call Resource Manager, and we're able to have these Terraform scripts in there that allow us to create pieces of infrastructure very, very quickly. We can also embed these Terraform scripts within our CI CD pipelines so that when we're deploying or we're creating test environments within these pipelines, we can quickly create and tear down environments for these purposes. So for example, if I need to quickly create a database or quickly create a compute within my pipeline, I can issue these Terraform commands within that pipeline, or I can use the multiple SDKs that OCI provides. So these SDKs provide uh, command line utilities for creating infrastructure as well. So if I didn't want to use Terraform and I wanted to use these SDKs, I can utilize an SDK in Python or PLSQL, or just go straight to the command line and run OCI CLI commands. So on this page here as examples, we have a quick example of a Terraform script for creating an autonomous database. And then we have that exact same command as an OCI CLI command. So we can see that depending on what we want to use and how we want to use it, we can quickly create these environments and these pieces of infrastructure for our cloud native database development. The third item we're going to look at is build, release, and run. And for database development, this is a very important one. In essence, it says we have to have these automated pipelines that we can use to test and apply code changes across our enterprise. And with database development, this is very important. Utilizing pipelines with what we just talked about in the two previous steps, which is database change management and that infrastructure as code, we can incorporate automated pipelines with our code repository and our development to ensure we catch issues early and often. So for example, when that developer is working on their tasks for say a sprint, if they're using the agile methodology, and they go to check in their code. They have a branch they've been working in. They use Liquibase to grab all their changes from their schema, and they commit that branch to their code repository. Now, that branch will eventually be merged into the main code line, usually via a pull request or a merge request, depending on what kind of code repository you're using. When that merge request or pull request is issued, we can automatically have our environment start a pipeline that takes that code that that developer wants to merge, puts it somewhere where we can apply it to these databases we can quickly create using that infrastructure as code, apply the changes, see the results, bring those results back to the developer or the development manager, check for issues, and then either decide, say, yes, there's issues, you need to fix this and recommit that code, 
or know the pipeline is clean, we can now merge that code. You can have these pipelines run as many times as you want and as in many places you want so that you're able to catch issues before they find their way into production, UAT, or development. This will allow you to have much more quality builds, much more quality product, and make much happier stakeholders because you know how that code is going to be applied to each environment as it goes along the pipeline from development to UAT to production. It reduces the surprises of code having an issue and increases the, the confidence not only in the code, but in your development organization as well. So the next we're going to talk about is concurrency. And that, in essence, talks about automatic scaling. A lot of times this can be referred to as pets versus cattle in these environments. Um, and to talk about a little bit more, if you have a pet, you give that pet a name, you care for it, you care for its well-being. Um, and this, this, however you want to see this, if you look at it as cattle, that cattle is there for an industrial purpose, shall we say, and you don't really care about it as much. It's kind of in the background. It does its job. It does what it needs to do. Um, uh, we should probably have a little bit more, uh, shall we say, softer comparison thing here. But for now, we'll continue to use pets versus cattle because a lot of folks do use that. But in this world of infrastructure, what in essence it means is that if I can quickly create these environments or these mid-tiers without caring what's in them because they're not holding certain config files or things that are stateful, I can bring them up, destroy them, and move them around very easily. So when we go to talking about scale, let's talk about the Oracle REST data services mid-tiers within OCI. Utilizing that infrastructure as code, I can quickly bring up Oracle REST data services mid-tiers and deploy them into my environment. And if I have one that's sick, or if it's, it's not acting just right as we want it to act, we're not exactly sure, instead of spending the time to troubleshoot it, we can instantly delete it, get rid of it, and bring up a new one that's healthy. So being able to be agile like that, being able to swap in these mid-tiers with containers or compute instances uh, is very important to have for this cloud-native development. Also having the ability to have these instances or these environments automatically scale. So with the autonomous database, you can set a CPU high watermark as well as storage where it's going to automatically add those CPUs or storage based upon events. So if that database sees that, hey, you know, this is really exceeding my seven or eight CPUs, I'm going to go add seven or eight more, it'll automatically do that. And then when it's done with that workload, it'll automatically bring it back down to that low water mark or that minimum amount that we set. Uh, same thing with compute, being able to add mid tiers, add more computing power to my environment so that when we do get these spikes, we're able to handle them and our end users are not aware that there is this going on in the background and their experience is seamless. There is no hiccups within there. Our next step is disposability. And this is where we can utilize the multi-tenant option of the Oracle database to create these pluggable databases that act in essence kind of like Docker environments or Docker containers. So quickly cloning and creating databases on the fly for our development environments, for testing environments, or even for production environments. So the autonomous database has multiple APIs for doing exactly this. The autonomous database can take a full clone of itself, or it can take a metadata only clone of itself. So you can envision when it is time for your developers to have those personalized environments, you can take multiple metadata only clones of production, and now they have an exact copy of the code that's in production, so they can use that for starting their tickets or their tasks on those databases. Uh, we don't have to create a database from scratch and then load code into it. The database and the code is already there. It's an exact copy of production and they're able to get their work done. 
We can also use Oracle REST Data Services database APIs for this. So if you're not using the autonomous database, we have REST APIs for PDB creation, cloning, as well as sparse cloning if you're using an Exadata. So being able to use these APIs for quickly creating these environments for your developers. We also have data pump APIs within these DB APIs. So you can envision if there is a data set that you want your developers to use, so you create a metadata only clone, and then you can use this data pump API to fill it with data so they can actually see how their code is working without taking a full copy of an environment. Maybe your environment is multiple terabytes big and you don't want all that data moved over. Maybe that data is sensitive in your production environment and you don't want the developers to see that data. Maybe it's patient information um, or, or financial information. Well, being able to utilize these APIs, we can use the API to create a metadata only clone. And then the second API would take a data pump export and import that data into that environment. So now they have test data to work with. We can also use these APIs for quickly creating environments to test our code on within pipelines, as we talked about before. So being able to quickly take that metadata clone, applying that code from that developer, seeing if there are any issues, and then instantly deleting that database. It's in essence a disposable database. These databases aren't going to stick around for very long. They're only used for testing and development. And through all these APIs, we can get a better handle on what's going on, who's using them, and be able to quickly clean them up or create them for our developers. Our next item here is DevProd Parity. And this kind of goes in line with what we just talked about with disposability. So again, using the multi-tenant option of the Oracle database to be able to create direct clones of these important environments. So if I need to create a production environment or a copy of a production environment, I'm able to very quickly with the ability to clone these pluggable databases. Uh, we can use hot cloning. So we can use Oracle REST data services to help create these hot clones that in essence mirror that production environment at that point in time. Maybe we have to troubleshoot an issue or troubleshoot an error and we need a, an exact replica of that environment to work in then we can do that with a hot cloning uh, API or with the autonomous database and take a full clone at any point in time. We can create these clones and then, as we said, with these pipelines, apply those changes with SQL CL and Liquibase. Liquibase can apply these changes into there. You can see how they work and then you can get that log file and see exactly what didn't work and what did work. So not having this code drift, knowing exactly where you are at any point and giving developers access to those environments that mimic those production environments or those UAT environments at any point in time. Very important with providing those developers that exact copy so they know what's in there and they're able to code on the latest release of that environment. You don't want them coding on an environment that's stale or a month old and then hoping that this works. You can give them an exact point in time copy of any environment that they can use for development, testing, or error checking and re resolution. The last item we're going to talk about is logging and the importance of logging. So it's not only logging, but being able to see exactly what's going on across all of your environments. So this kind of also includes metrics. Now OCI does have out of the box Grafana plugins for databases as well as all the components of OCI, which will help you feed the metrics that are going on in OCI directly into Grafana dashboards. The second plugin is a logging plugin that will help you pull logs out of the OCI logging service directly into a Grafana dashboard. So this is important because if we're capturing these metrics in real time of what's going on with the database, what's going on with our compute instances, what's going on with our Oracle REST data service instances, uh, we can see exactly when an issue happens pinpoint where that issue is and then take action. You can also utilize some of the logging that we have within our compute instances in OCI to help take those logs from Oracle REST data services and push them directly into the OCI logging service. Once we do that, we can now expose them and add them to 
the log dashboard that we have exposed through the Grafana plugin. What else we can do is, especially with our autonomous databases, is since we don't have access to the OS and we sometimes need to see what's going on with these trace files or these alert logs, we can use Oracle REST data services and REST enable these V$ Diag tables that are in the autonomous database. So we use ORDs, we REST enable these Diag tables, and then we expose them again through our Grafana dashboard. So if something happened at the database level, we could instantly see through our dashboard what happened, take a look at these Diag tables, take a look at the ORDs logs and say, oh, XYZ happened, I know how to fix that, we'll do this and we'll fix it. Or if something happened at the mid-tier or at the load balancing level, we can either bring up a brand new uh, infrastructure or mid-tier uh, and get rid of the old one, again, our pets first cattle uh, analogy over there, or we can have it fail over to a new environment. Maybe something's wrong with the network going into that data center and we issue a failover, we fail over the entire stack to another region, and now that region is the primary one. Again, the database has been keeping in sync with DataGuard, and these mid-tiers, again, are stateless, so we can instantly bring them up without having to worry about uh, a config file or something that they're writing to, they're just automatically brought up and they're pointed to our disaster recovery database. So logging is a very important uh, point to stress here that in OCI we have the ability to grab logs from across the enterprise, from across your infrastructure, from across your cloud services and push them into various dashboards in Grafana so at any point you can see what's happening with your enterprise at any time and then take action if an issue occurs. So how can I get started with cloud native database development? What do I need? How do I do it? So we have a lot of talks that we do with customers that we talk about getting CIC or database CICD within their organization. And the first thing we always say is, this is something you start slowly and you work into. And the same applies here. So take pieces of these, ones that you can work with your organizations and get up and running quicker, and then build upon these. So maybe start with SQL CL and Liquibase for database change management. Maybe start with a code repository so you're tracking those changes across versions. And then you could add things, add those pipelines that are going to test the code. Add automatic deployment to your UAT and dev environments. And then when you're comfortable with it, you can maybe add the production environments. And then utilize that multi-tenant option. So use the cloning features of pluggable databases and the autonomous database to create these container-like environments for your developers so they can work in individual environments and then get rid of them quickly once that code is done and pushed into the repository. Or have your error checking or, or test development environments copies of production so you're more these environments more closely resemble production. So when there are issues, you can utilize these environments for either uh, issue resolution or just to see how that code is going to react when you put it into these environments because they're exact copies of that production or UET environment. And lastly, stream these events, these logs, these metrics, from OCI into dashboard services so you can see exactly what's going on at all times and know if there are any issues and then either have the service automatically react to these issues by creating more environments or scaling or having your, your operations people say, oh, I see this, let's fix this environment or if it's something that's catat catastrophic, fail over to in a completely separate region where our end users may not even see any interruption of service and continue working in that new environment. So again, start slowly, pick some of these items here and start with them and then add them on top of what you're doing one by one to create that full cloud native database development environment. This concludes our cloud native database development on-demand session for Oracle Database World, and thank you very much for attending.